think that's it. And we're live. And we're live. Just like that. And I made it by the skin of my teeth. Talk about <laughs> better late than never. Everybody, welcome to SVT Time live Thursday. I don't know what the date is. I don't even know what the episode is at this point. It's We're somewhere in the teens. Um, my name is Dino. We've got Dom as usual. And today's guest is the ever special, awesome John Button joining us today. Hey, everybody. Welcome, John. How are you, buddy? I'm pretty good. Yeah, I'm all right, you know? Yeah, everything. Over there now? <laughs> and I, I I apologize for the uh for anybody that obviously doesn't know what went on behind the scenes. Like my internet went down and like at 1 30 Eastern. I'm like typing away, doing my emails, and all of a sudden, like everything just disappeared. You know, so like, all right, well, I'll reboot my computer. No, that doesn't work. All right, well, I'll reboot my rotten. No, that doesn't work. Come to find out, I think internet is down in my area. So if for some reason I disappear again, <laughs> it's all yours, buddy. <laughs> we were ready, man. Somehow, I, some way. You know what? I I know you guys would be you'd be fine without me. We're last glad you're here. Went out, my yeah. internet went out before I went to bed last night, and I was just like, "Well, tomorrow's going to be. We'll see if this works or not." And then you had the plague, so yeah, here we yeah. are. We made it. My next. We're here. We're here. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> No. So how's everything going, John? I know, you know, you've, you've done a couple of these already, but you've done them like in the, in the groups with like Eva and, and Hutch and everything. This is like, I'm, I'm so glad to finally have you on as, as a solo act. <laughs> well, you know, when you have somebody like Hutch on, I, I, I just shut my mouth and listen. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, Hutch is like Jones, like I, you know, like what am I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just gonna listen to Daryl. Uh, no, you know, I, I will say this, you know, and and we will have Hutch on at some point too, but he is a walking encyclopedia of of music history. He really is. Like, yeah, yeah. If he was, if he wasn't, if he wasn't doing the Bonnie gig or what he does, he would be teaching like a musicology class in, in some university. Yeah, right. half of that history he played on. <laughs> that's just, that's I why mean, seriously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Oh man! So everybody's how he everybody's healthy. Everybody's happy. I'm assuming we're all Hang good. Yeah, all good so far. Knock yeah. on wood. <laughs> I, yeah. So John, what have you? Oh, go ahead, Dom. Well, I was just saying. Yeah, I was gonna ask John the same because I, uh, I, I followed John on Instagram, and it's like. Every day, it seems like you got like a cool, different project. I think the other day you were tracking for like it was either a video game or some kind of scoring thing. Cartoon. Or cartoon. It was a cartoon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, I'll see you bust out the Rick every once in a while. That old school Rick. It's really cool. Uh, single yeah. Rick. Yeah, right. exactly. That is. You don't see many single pickup Ricks. Yeah. I, I got it here, ready for you. We'll bust that out later. All right, All right. nice. Um, but yeah, I've been, you know, keeping somewhat busy. Of course, I look busier on Instagram than I really am. <laughs> but you know, um, yeah, I do a few sessions from home. That's about it. I did during the pandemic time. I did one record. I did a Christmas album with the Goo Goo Dolls. Yeah. Um, which ended up being really cool. It was really fun. I played a lot of upright on it. Nice. Um, which is why they didn't have Robbie, their regular bass player, do it. Um, and that was interesting. That was totally all during major lockdown time. You know, we were all wearing masks and, um, but we did it and, uh, I thought it turned out great. So next Christmas. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Listen, take a listen. I, I awesome. got to ask you like, what is, and anybody else that knows this, that, that, that does a lot of session work in Nashville or LA or New York, what is like, what is the protocol? When, you, when you're called into a session at that point, are they doing COVID tests on site or are you just making sure everybody's masked up? How is that working? It's It obviously varies per session and yep. you know who's doing it. It's also seemed, it seems to have varied over time. So the Goo Goo Dolls thing, like the first session I did with them must have been in March a year ago. So it was like- It was right then, yeah. You know. um, and they all had gotten tested um, and I think I got tested too. They didn't, I don't think they asked me to, but I just, I did, I was getting one anyway. They're pretty easy to, they were easy to get here in LA, much easier than a lot of other places, thankfully. Um, so I had done that. So 
we just sort of took it upon ourselves to do that. And like when we recorded, it was me overdubbing by myself. So I was actually in the tracking room. Oh, okay. Um, and they were mostly in the control room. So we were separated by a piece of glass yeah. for most of the time. Um, and then I did a, I did do like a lot, uh, some sort of like a, a video shoot with them for that record. They did like a Christmas special. Yeah. On the, I guess it was on the internet. Um, and they had like rapid COVID testing there. So when everybody showed up, you got like a 15 minute COVID test. Oh, wow. um, and that was, that was interesting. Um, Cause we were, since we were on camera, everybody on camera was without masks. So okay. they had everybody and you know, it was like full camera production. There was like a hundred mm. people there. Everybody yeah. was tested on the way in the door. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, it varies. I definitely know other, I haven't, man, it's been a while since I've done a session in a room with people at a studio, but I know other friends that have, and yeah, it seems to be mostly everybody gets tested and, um, and then wears masks and does that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's you, like you say, it does, it does vary too. You know, obviously back then, I mean, you, like you said, that was, that was, you know, it was right on the cusp of everything shutting down and, um, that's, that's when they were doing the, the, the brain scrapes too, with the COVID. Mm -hmm. test. So, yeah. I never got one of those. Thank goodness. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's, all right. So now you were doing, uh, you, you also had some videos. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm trying to catch up here. Um, <laughs> you lost a half an hour trying to get your internet working I know it, I know it. <laughs> with, uh, with scary pockets. Yeah, that was really cool. Right. Thank you for reminding me. That was totally during right. COVID yeah. time. Um, I was so honored to get asked. I'm a super fan of their stuff and have been watching those. And I was sort of like, oh, I hope they are. <laughs> you know, I know a lot of those, those guys and girls and stuff. So I was super stoked when they asked me to do it. Um, and I was a little, honestly, a little nervous because it's, that stuff is recorded live in the room. Like the Goo Goo Dolls, I was by myself in a room overdubbing to stuff yeah. that are recorded. This, you know, you walk in, you don't know what you're going to do. They're like, hey, let's play this song. Let's figure out an arrangement. It's like super off the cuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with a singer, like I, as we've learned, singing is, you know, as far as spreading COVID is a major issue, right? Sure. You can't sing with a mask on and you're, breathing you know deeply and so i was a little like how's this gonna go i was a little apprehensive but they ended up having the singer in a iso booth through the glass okay um and we were all masked in the other room and distant and it was a decent sized studio um 64 sound in la one of my favorite studios that's actually nice. in my neighborhood nice um and so yeah it was that was so fun to do that and i thought it, i thought both of those tracks turned out really cool now was that was that in one that was just one day yeah that okay. was yeah, a few hours. Boom, yeah. boom. Yeah, it was wow. cool. yeah. What's your like mental prep for something like that where you're like, I'm gonna be on my feet? What's I, yeah, I, for that? I don't. I didn't know what. It was the first time I'd done it. I didn't know what to yeah. expect. I mean, yeah, just you know, eat your Wheaties and get some sleep. <laughs> 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 well, you know, I mean, I. I as long as I've known you, you've you've always been very humble, but you're also an amazing bass player. So yeah. there's a reason why you were on that session. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, let's get John in here to do something. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah. Now, talk, can we talk a little bit about your your background? Like, we, I know you came from Alaska. You're originally from Alaska, but first of all, what was the music scene like in Alaska when you were when you were coming up? Um, so for me, it didn't seem like at the time there was much of like a play in a band and get, go in your friend's garage and play rock music kind of vibe. I mean, your friend's garage is, you know, 15 degrees if you're lucky anyway. So, um, but there was a very well-funded, uh, arts in the schools program because at that time in Alaska, oil was flowing. And yep. so the government in Alaska was flush with money. Okay. Education was super well funded. Um, great music in the schools program. And also a couple of really great like summer camp music 
scenes in my hometown um, mm -hmm. where they would bring really great uh, artists and teachers up from the lower 48, okay. um, which for us was very fancy to have somebody from the lower 48 come. <laughs> Um, and so I did totally did the music in the schools thing. So I orchestra in third grade, uh, jazz wow. band starting in seventh grade and all through high school. Um, okay. There was a really, really good youth symphony yeah. that I forget, I must have started probably around 12 playing wow. in the symphony with a full, you know, brass and woodwinds and playing amazing, you know. That's incredible. Yeah, wow. it, what an experience. I mean, to play in a full symphony, it's like, well, that's cool. Like a full bass section, you know, we're yeah. in unison. And, um, so that was amazing experience. And, you know, learn, learn to read music, which, you know, I don't use a ton these days, but when mm -hmm. I have to, I can do it. And that's handy. Yeah, yeah. That's, but that, that's incredible. That, that led you to, now I'm assuming from there, you went to North Texas? University of North Texas, yeah, they have a great jazz program. I, when I was last couple of years of high school, I really wanted to be like straight ahead jazz dude. I was super into, you know, upright. When I got to North Texas, after a couple of years, I sort of got burned out on that and sort of almost discovered rock music. Like I grew up listening to pop and a lot of jazz and classical and weird stuff. Yeah. Um, and then somehow in in uh, in college, after a couple of years, I sort of got the the uh, the bug to play more rock more music yeah. and yeah and I mean, the whole thing no, and, uh, can be, yeah they do that that can be pretty intense too I mean I we I know a lot of I went to North Texas and you know it's it's pretty intense especially if you like it's the intense. rock band and stuff like that super yeah. intense so when I arrived there um you guys familiar with Mike Pope yep he's yeah, pretty yeah. well known right yeah. yeah. Yeah, Federa and Pope preamps, and yeah, played with Al Demiola, and I <laughs> just got him. And that, he was like, that too. <laughs> so he was a freshman when I was a freshman there. Okay. Oh wow. And dude, like he ripping, just yeah. ripping. And interestingly, so it's fairly uncommon as a freshman to get into like the top bands there. Like a lot of the guys in the top bands are like grad students, you know. Right. Right, <laughs> they're like forty, you know, yeah. and so Mike ended up freshman year top band one o'clock because he's in his freshman year. Yeah, and I ended up in the two o'clock. So we were like this, pretty okay. much the whole way through school. And then for whatever reason, uh, our last year there when we were both seniors, he I, I'm not sure if somebody in the faculty was like, hey, why don't you give somebody else a chance, Mike? So he didn't do the one o'clock. Okay. And I got to do it for a year. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it was cutthroat. I mean, if you got the gig, you got the gig. Like, nobody could move in on your territory at that point, from what I understand. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's, I mean, there are so many students there. I mean, there are only, what, like, maybe 12 spots for a bass player to be in a band. Because yep. as opposed to, you know, saxophone, there's five opportunities in each each band. I think yeah. there are God, like nine, I think there are nine bands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So, and a couple of the, a few of the lower bands have two bass players that switch off just to give more people an opportunity. But I mean, I don't know. There must be a, probably a hundred bass players there. They're all amazing. Yeah. You know, so wow. yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty intense. <laughs> Coming from like classical jazz pop world into rock, was there like an experience that you had playing where you're just, was there some, was, I'm curious if there was like an amp experience too that you had where you were just like, wait a second, like. <laughs> no, it, you know, it wasn't an amp experience. It was funny enough. I think, I'm not sure about this, but if I, if my foggy memory serves me correctly, um, growing up in Alaska, we couldn't get cable. I had like th three channels. So no MTV, no music videos, none of that. So then in college, I believe, I, I know I went for spring break uh, too far to go home to Alaska. My sister's in Arizona at the time, I think. So I went and hung with my sister for a week in Phoenix. She had cable. She had MTV. <laughs> so I think, I th if I remember right, I think I was like, whoa, what is going on here? I see, you know, it's like, yeah. MTV. I'm like, that's cool. I want to do that. Right? That's awesome. Oh, I don't know. 
<laughs> I'm that you had and you never left. <laughs> I wonder if you took like a rock guy and you put him like front row of, or put him like an orchestra pit like 20 years later and he didn't know that that existed if it would be the, you know, a right? similar event. I mean, yeah. I'm, wow. I'm That's crazy. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Man, and then obviously from from LA or uh, from North Texas, did you go right to LA or did you did you have any well, between? Yeah, I, so I think around my last year at North Texas, I started playing with like a top forty cover band that did like you know everything from playing a bar to doing weddings and all kinds of stuff. Yep, and it paid pretty decent, especially compared to the cost of living in where I was living outside of Dallas was like nothing yeah and so uh as i finished school i was playing with that band a lot and i was like you know what i'm gonna hang here paying literally 90 dollars a month for rent <laughs> nine dollars a month <laughs> yeah i mean you could go get lunch for two dollars i mean it was like insane but so, you a hundred bucks then <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so i'm like i'm gonna hang here before i move to la yep. and I just socked away as much money as I could. I lived like a pauper. And and so I had a nice nest egg and then got in my car with a few friends from there. Was a, I had a few friends from Texas that drove up to LA. We caravaned. Yep. And yep. there I was. Had a couple of awesome. bass players, a couple of basses in my car and a, I don't know, a dream. I knew two people. So that was helpful. That, <laughs> that's one more than I knew when I got that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to be young, I was just like, sure, I'll drive to LA. I don't know. I'll right? see you yeah. I love that. Now, love when, that. when was that, John? When did when when about was that you moved? That up? was 1870, <laughs> uh, 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 1994. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, I was I was in LA from I moved there in 91. And obviously, like 97, 98, I moved back to New England. So I was in right. L.A. right around by the time you had gotten there. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I did, you, know, you do the same thing. It's like everybody follows their dream, man. They load up their gear. You know, I had – I tell this story all the time. Like, I, I moved – I had a, a U-Haul truck loaded with all my gear, my Harley Davidson, and four SVTs. That's like, amazing. What? Heads and cabinets. Yeah, that was my rock. Amazing. Rocket. England. And, and back then, like you could, especially around here, like this was the time when like rack mount stuff was becoming popular. So stores were dumping SVTs like $200. You could buy a blue line SVT because nobody wanted it. Wow. And wow. then when I was in LA, like obviously LA, you know, was a different scene there. Vintage values started coming up you know, started going up in value. So whenever I needed groceries or rent for a couple of months, you know, in uh, what was the magazine back there? Uh, was it LA Weekly or one of LA, one of, one of the one of the like music magazines? Yeah, LA Weekly uh, probably, yeah. I, I, I'd, list a, I'd list an SVT and a flight case <laughs> with, with an 810 cab. And, you know, it'd get me like a couple of, maybe like 1500 bucks or a couple of grand. And I had four of them, so that kind of financed a year. <laughs> amazing. amazing! I love that story. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So unfortunately, I don't have those amps anymore because they put me through school, but they served their purpose. You know, it's incredible though. I feel like that's like a could be like a classic '80s montage of like the U-Haul door opening and Dino coming out on a Harley. Uh, literally SVTs on his back. <laughs> I Harley and four SVTs and all my bases and my clothes. No, you're just driving around in a van, like, hey, buddy. Well, you you the you know, truck. You want <laughs> grocery store? I've got some stereo speakers for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, it's funny. Whenever uh, a good, a dear friend of mine, Dale Titus, um, he he, he had a pickup truck. And whenever we would audition for a gig, we'd audition together. So, like, we auditioned for a number of gigs in L.A., and the stipulation was he would come to my apartment and help me load my SVT. You know, I had an A-10 cabinet, and that's what we would bring to the audition. And and because he would transport it, I'd, you know, yeah, by all means, use the rig for the audition. We'd, we'd show up for auditions, and people would be like, 
wait a second, you guys are both here for the same audition. You showed up in the same car and you're using the same rig. It's like, well, kind of like brothers at this point. <laughs> you know? Been there. Uh, yeah, man, man. Um, so, all right. So you're in LA. What, what, what gets you started? Like what, I mean, this is like every bass player's dream and, and question is like, what was the turning point? Like, what was the thing that got you started in the journey that you're on right now? Right. Um, well, when I first got here, I pretty much just said yes to everything, just about, right? So, you know, I was playing probably in like, with like five different singer songwriters and eight bands and, you know, just like, free rehearsal three free rehearsals every day like just running around you know but that's how you meet people and meeting people is how you know you get somewhere and you know i would always try to bring my 100 percent show up on time my gear worked i knew yeah. the songs you know i wasn't a jerk most of the time um and, you know so and then this guy yeah. takes a notch up and gets some gigs. It's like, hey, call John. You know, and you start to meet people. Um, I had a couple, like, I think probably the biggest turning point for me, um, I had done a few tours and things after a few years. Um, and I think the main thing that turned the corner for me was I, I, I got asked to audition for uh, Michelle Branch. Okay. totally unknown she was like 17 at the time um and i ended up getting the gig and going on tour with her and that was cool but then she sort of like blew up um and had like i think i forget if she had like a number one single or top 10 or whatever yeah. but she got pretty big and so that meant that i sort of managed to get past that catch 22 of like who have you played with well if you haven't played with anybody we, you know, because if somebody yeah. calls you for a bigger gig, the first question is like, you know, what's your track record? Who do you yep. play? Who have you played with? So then I sort of had a like, hey, I've played with like a major label, big tour, you know, yeah. and so that sort of uh, led me to get some other things. I played with a guy named Robbie Rosa, um, who's a Latin artist. Um, he produced Ricky Martin's big record. Um, and he's really big in South America and stuff. Not, he didn't quite break here. He's a, a super talented artist. Anyway, I started playing with him. And then at some point, um, I had, I, when I was playing with Michelle Branch, I had met Brendan Buckley that plays drums with Shakira. Okay. Um, we were doing shows together with Shakira and stuff. And so he sort of went, hey, John played with Michelle Branch, who's like a pop girl singer, but he also played with this Latin artist that's sort of known for being a little bit difficult to please as is Shakira. And he was like, Hmm, those two things together, probably a good fit for Shakira. Yep. yep. Um, and so I ended up getting that gig and, you know, snowballs. It's awesome. It's like the shampoo commercial. I told two friends and they told two friends and then. They <laughs> yeah. And hopefully those two friends are telling something positive about you. Right. Right. Well, you know, I mean, I mean, everybody says, you know, Obviously, you know talent. It, it, talent is paramount. You you got to be able to play, and you got to you know you got to have the talent. That's there's no question. That's that's how you get to the audition, and then from there on, it's like you know. Well, I toured with him, or you know, he's a we've hung. We've I've spent a year on a tour bus with him, or mm -hmm. you know, I know his work ethic. That that sort of thing. After that, it's all. You know, it's like, like you say, it's all the hang and, and, and yeah, it's like who you are at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what the, I mean, there are jokes about, you know, bad word about people getting around, right. Yeah. Much more than good word. Right. And it, it's so true. Like if somebody's on tour and they're a, a pain, that word does get around to people. Sure. And it's like, you know, I've definitely gotten calls of like, hey, can you recommend to somebody that's not so-and-so? Really? So and so we heard that they were a pain in the butt. So, yeah. you know, anybody but them. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. I've had many conversations like that. Yeah. Wow. And you hate getting those calls because you're like, oh man, geez, you know. Yeah. 
So um, I know I tell everyone you're a good guy, Dino, no matter what. <laughs> I've been in the business long enough. They know you're lying. <laughs> that just makes you look bad. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> What do you mean Dino's a good guy? We've known him for all. He's kind of a jerk. <laughs> um, man, it's, now, you know, obviously education, you know, I, I, I've i always been a huge, I think everybody should should have some sort, some form of music education, public school especially. Mm-hmm. You know, especially, that's the big thing. But how important was that in your beginnings or your upbringing to where you are? Like you were saying, you don't, a lot of your sessions, you obviously don't do a lot of reading, but if a producer or a writer does have a chart and throws it in front of you, 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 you be able to read it, obviously. How important was that in your beginning, in your beginning career or the beginning of your career? I think the key word there is in the beginning or the key phrase. Yep. Um, I think one thing that it really did for me is sort of, upped my trajectory. So, um, and I, I, if anybody reads Malcolm Gladwell, he sort of talks about this, like he has a whole thing where he talks about, uh, I think their book is The Tipping Point. Okay. He talks about hockey players that are born at a certain time. Yeah. They're like bigger when they get into that year's league and that makes them sort of have this trajectory. Yeah. So me getting a good music education early meant that I sort of had a jump on getting to play with better players earlier on. And you learn from the other people you play with. So then after I played with those people, you know, then I was that much better to sort of get into a better scenario the next year and improve that much more. And it sort of just makes your trajectory go up to, you you know, you're playing with better and better people. And I, does that make sense? I, yeah, I think that just yeah. sort of helped me get ahead early on. I, yeah. I don't know that, I mean, certainly there are aspects of my music, music education that, that helped me now, you know, knowing theory and, and all kinds of stuff like that, but it's not essential, but I think it helped me sort of get that, that edge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that I totally get what you're saying. It's like, you know, they always say, you know, in anything, it's like whether you're in sports or music or anything, even if you're even if you're a tennis player, you know, a hob, you always want to play with somebody just a little bit ahead of you because you're going to up your game. And then, you know, you, you're constantly going to up your game to the better player to a certain degree. Yeah. So and you, you got started playing, you know, very young with an orchestra and always in a band setting. So as a bassist, that's a huge advantage too to go into a situation where you already are trained maybe even subconsciously to listen to everybody else and not be overbearing and kind of like it's what it's so much about what you don't play and i feel like a lot of people they don't have that training or they don't they're killer players on their own but they don't know how to actually live in the side of a song or with a band so i'm sure that that you had too yeah and actually i suppose that more and more these days you know there are probably a lot of people that are in their bedroom Yep. Just by themselves, yeah, and maybe uh, are not learning as much how to interact with other people. And yeah, so I played, I played, you know, played with lots of other humans um, and yeah. learned a lot in school about who to listen to and how to listen and how to mm-hmm. interact and how to, you know, and that's huge. But you know, yeah. yeah. Did you have any flashbacks on this last Who tour where they had uh, the strings behind you? Of being in school was oh, like, sure. uh, holy crap yeah. how did this happen <laughs> oh yeah totally yeah i mean it was always cool. you know it was so fun because we would play with a different orchestra in every city it was like you oh, know too yeah um and so i would always go over to the bass section and go talk to them and you know a lot of them you know play electric bass too and they want to know about my bass and yeah you know, we would always have a cool camaraderie and i'd be always i'm on the other side of the stage from the bass section but i'd be, always be looking over like, oh, <laughs> i'm representing over here in the yeah. Yeah, totally. section. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, at that really age fun. what what was your draw to bass younger like did you start on that instrument or did you kind of like like i start on trumpet randomly and then <gasps> like sweet. Over to, yeah um I started on piano very young. I think like four or something. I took piano lessons like from four to five or something. Um, and then uh, my oldest brother, all my older siblings play music. They're all very good. Um, none of them are doing it professionally at this point, but they're all really great. So 
Uh, my oldest brother is 10 years older than me. He was a drummer um, and he was playing in some bands around town and could never find a bass player. So he bought a bass when he was 16 or 17. So I'm like six or seven. I think I was seven at the time. Um, and I was like, that looks cool. Oh, which is a good segue. How cool does it look? Oh yeah, that's the rig. How cool was it? Was cool. It was um, really cool. So this is the bass that he bought. In, That's it. Awesome. Yeah, you know, like 1977 or whatever, wow. 78. Um, and so this thing's, you know, laying around the house. I'm like, "That's cool. I want to check that out." And bless his heart, let his seven year old brother right his bass, and he showed me some stuff. You know, showed me some records, and like, this is how you play this. And um, and then my brilliant mom was like, "You should do school orchestra and play bass. Okay. Same tuning, same strings, same notes." Yeah. Thanks, mom. Yeah, that's really cool. Oh. That's did so your that, brother just decide one? Like, what did he kind of give it up one day? Does he still play? Uh, yeah he he went to Berkeley in Boston for a few years and was playing professionally around Boston. Um, and then had a kid and you know needed to support his family and sort of had to ditch that. Um, but he, yeah, he's a great great drummer. Um, and still plays a little bit, but he's doing other things now. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think that's the truly the only single pickup break I've ever seen. Yeah, it's weird, right? I mean, I mean, I think it was just less expensive. Um, no binding. Yeah. Right. Um, and dots instead of yeah angles. I think I have a feeling this was sort of like the budget model. Yeah. yeah. Um, no the bridge is still like that. fantastic. Though. Yeah, none of that. Just single output. Do they still make them anymore? The single pick. I have no idea. I'm, I'm afraid to like mess with my internet browser right now and fear. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I uh, I keep flats on this, so it's got like that kind of more McCartney vibe. Pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. Kind of deep. Very cool. Even have though you, it doesn't have the neck pickup, but have you done any sessions with that, John? Lots. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I frequently bring it. It's really cool. It's nice. like yeah, yeah. I use it a lot. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I, when you brought that out at the, on the last SVT time, Dom and I were like, "Ooh, wow, it's yeah. a brick!" You know, yeah. And of all the bases that you know, I, I personally owned and and bought and sold, I've never owned a Rickenbacker Same ever, here. and I've always wanted one. And I've always wanted one. And like there, you know, we talked about this last time because they're they have a different neck size and it makes you play different. Like yeah, they're yeah. just such a different animal. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just like, and the Hoffner is the same way, you know, For you're sure. going to wonder if McCartney would have written or played a lot of those bass lines that he played, if it was on say like a P bass or something yeah. a little chunkier or, yeah. you know, that's, oh, that's a int really interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's hard to say. Cause I mean, he puts on a Rickenbacker and he sounds exactly the same as he does on a Hoffner. He, yeah. he has such a voice. It's like, the yeah. bass might not make that much of a difference. Yeah, yeah, uh, man. You know, so I, 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 I gotta say, you know, I remember distinctly the Nam show that you had come into the Ampeg booth and you had just gotten the gig with the Who. <laughs> and I think I got emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't believe how happy I. I I am so happy for you. Like that, like you I'm living vicariously through you as as a lot of who fans are and bass players. And I mean you're you no know pressure. yeah, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> um, but you're not, you know, as as Pino too, it's like, do you feel like you're filling shoes or you're putting on a different pair of shoes? Uh, I would say one shoe of each. Okay. If there's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I definitely feel like I'm not only, I mean, nobody can fill Entwistle's shoes. That's oh, just, he is such a unique individual on the instrument. I, you know, and also neither Roger and especially Pete, they don't, they don't want somebody trying to, pretend to be yeah but their their dear friend for life that passed away yep. yeah you yep. know which is what john is to them you know yep. um and so they they don't really want that um and i think that's a little bit of 
part of the reason that Pete got Pino. I mean, it it also had to do with Pino had played with Pete on his solo stuff for years, and he's also the best bass player in the world. So why wouldn't you get him? Um, but also, he, you know, I I'm pretty sure Pete said to him like, "Don't try to do Antwistle, just do Pino." You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's definitely no request from those guys to like try and do anything like trying to be and yeah. you know yeah yeah um but at the same time you know there's however many thousand people in the audience yeah it, you know like oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. expecting that so I, I do feel somewhat you know there there are definitely places where you got to do what what john did to the best of your ability yeah yeah so i, I think there's a, there's a balance there I still haven't had the opportunity to teach you the solo to my generation, but at some point we'll get to <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I think I got to learn it first. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk about gear a little bit. So on, on this last tour, uh, I'm, I'm trying to speak. You, I don't, don't bust me all the time on this. I just caught myself saying it. Trying to, <laughs> In your head. Trying to say tour. I, I can't say tour. I've got to say tour. <laughs> so for all of you that don't understand my Bostonese, it's it's tour, but it's tour. Um, on this last Who tour, you were using two 210 AVs and a PF50 head, correct? Like, I call it the Slim Stack. The Slim Stack, half of an 810 cabinet. Right. How did that work out for you? Fantastically. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so just to back up a little bit. So prior to that, with the Who, I was using an SVT and a like a Marshall guitar amp. Just right. um, and then for this tour, it was with an orchestra, as we sort of mentioned. Um, and they're violin, like twenty violins, two or three feet from me on stage, each with a condenser mic on them. So. I have to play at like pin drop territory, you know, and an SVT to, I mean, when you turn SVT down a certain amount, it's, it's just, you yeah. know, like yeah. it's like trying to drive an Indy car in traffic is what I feel like. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Analogy. So, um, yeah. I got the PF 50 and the, the little two tens. Um, and actually I started, I, now that I think about it, I started using those Roger Daltrey, uh, for his solo tour, he did the orchestra thing. And that's sort of what led to the Who doing it because it went so well, well for Roger. And when I started, when we started Roger's tour um, doing the orchestra thing, that's when I got the the little 2 210 thing with the PF50. It sounds great. It's awesome because you can, you know, the PF50, you can turn it up to where it sounds decent, but it's still pretty quiet. Yeah. And stacking those two tens up with a full orchestra on stage. You you need the extra real estate. So the thing you know, it's yeah. like that going up, and it's yeah. it's great. Yeah. It's so is that uh, mainly just your stage volume, the two two tens? Yeah, it's just, and honestly, a, more than anything, it's so the orchestra can hear me. Because mm. <clears throat> um, okay. I'm on in ears, I don't really need it. I like to have it there, honestly, in case my in ears. I mean, there are times they cut out, and you. You can actually hear yourself. That's handy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, Simon Townsend playing guitar. He's in front. He's near me, uh, and he's not on in ears, so he can hear a little bit. I think he hears it more through a stage wedge because I'm I'm pretty quiet. But at least the because the orchestra, um, there's not much for them to hear. Zach Starkey is playing electric drums, <clears throat> which wow. is shocking. Yeah, oh, that's very, very shocking. Yeah, that's yeah, he wild. makes it sound pretty good. Um, because I mean, there's just he plays so loud, there's no way it would just be impossible. And like, I honestly have to say, I feel like the electric drums sound better than a drum set in a fishbowl, you know what I mean? When you put yeah. all the glass yeah. around it, it's like, uh. yeah. yeah, but he, I mean, he plays so loud, the, the pads, like, if I take my inners out, it's just. It's <laughs> <so loud. laughs> Even wow. on electric drums, he's hitting that hard. Wow. That's him. Wow. Now, will you, um, to, to give props to our sister our sister company here, you're also using a Helix as well, correct? On, I'm, on using, 
I'm using the Helix more than so the the PF50 is basically a monitor. Okay. You know, it's not mic'd or anything. Um, it's you know, like I say, so the orchestra can hear me. A few other so there's sound on stage. Um, but what's going out front is all the Line Six. So, um, I I go into a Noble Tube Di okay. first. I send that to the house. I don't think they use that at all. Um, uh, and then I actually have two outputs um, from the Helix. I have the Helix LT, I guess it's called. Okay. Um, the floor, floor yep. the slightly smaller floor thing. Yep. Um, so I have two channels in it. I have one that's a like a Marshall guitar amp and one that's an SVT. Okay. Um, and I send those out separately to the house so they have control over those. Um, and then I actually have it set up with four snapshots for my, my main sound. I have one main sound I use for 90% of the time. Yeah. So four snapshots um, going left to right, more and more grind on the Marshall. Oh, okay. cool. So it's really cool. Like if it's a mellow song, I click over on the left and the Marshall's pretty mellow and I've got a pretty, you know, mellow sound. And then I can click, you know, if it's a more aggressive song, I can click over to the right and it's like, ah! Right, right. Really it cool. so great. It's really the, cool. Uh, the now, Marshall Grit, are you EQing that? Is it almost like a crossover where you're just all top end? Or no, I, actually yeah, I keep them both full range. Cool. Seems to work well for me. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah, and front of house loves that. You know, I know like, you know, sometimes, um, you know, depending on the gig and depending on the front of house engineer, like just case in point, I know um, uh, uh, Billy Joel's bass player, Andy uh, uh, Sashon. Mm, yeah. you know, I've talked to him about DIs and, and our SCR DI and this and that. And, and you know, he's like, Listen, I, I don't know the front of house engineer's name for Billy, but he was like, he's been Billy's front of house guy for 30 years. And he insists on me using this DI and nothing else. And, you know, sometimes when you step into a gig like that, you know, even being just, you know, being the new guy for one thing, but also it's like, I'm not going to tell the guy that's been mixing sound for this band for 30 years, yeah. what the eye I'm going to use. You it know? can be tricky. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, similar situation with the who um, sure. our front of house guy has been with them forever. He also works with everybody. Um, he's, you know, he's heavy, um, yeah. but he's also, he's, He's pretty open-minded and he actually is a fan of modeled stuff. And he actually was trying to get the guitar. I know definitely with Roger Daltrey's solo band, he was trying to get both guitar players on model amps. Okay. And they were like, no. Yeah. But um, yeah. so he's a he's a fan of that. He's into it. And also, you know, I'm making their life easier because I mean, if you've got some loud bass amp right next to the violin section they're trying to mix i mean they're trying to mix an orchestra and like what a nightmare out there and to know that there's not all this weird bass rumble going through every mic on the stage right is right. helpful to them you know yeah. i i'm always whatever tour i'm on i'm always after sound check out to the front of house like how how's everything is there anything i can do like tell me like you know, because I want it to sound good out front. That's my, yeah. you know, much more than I care about what it sounds like for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's you know, that they, as we all know, a, a, a sound engineer could make our life heaven, or they could make it the complete opposite. You know, absolutely. So and yeah, it just it just makes the gig much more enjoyable when everybody's happy and everybody has you know. It's great. Again, getting back to our original statement. That's why you know, that's why you work with the folks that you work with because you're, you're so, you're so great to work with, you know, for that, for that same reason, everybody yeah. works together. I'm a team player. I, yeah. you know, we're all, I want us all to be moving in the same direction with yeah. the same goals. Yep. Absolutely. If, if no, you're nicer to that, the front of house guy, you get like an extra two or three DB each show. <laughs> 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 but yeah. that's, it's probably like your the the orchestra roots again and you you didn't come from like this rock you know you weren't like this rock, rock, rock punk band or whatever where you're just like no i'm cranking my svt and you're gonna deal with it <laughs> right yeah. right that's yeah. right i only say that because i was that way for a while <laughs> 
But, you know, it's funny. I don't see many, like, I mean, every band that I've been in, of course, I've been the only bass player in, in, in the bands that I've been in, but I, so many other bass players that I know and have worked with and, and see, it's usually the bass player that's the most agreeable when it comes to turning volume or, or being polite on stage as far as volume and overbearing. It's, you know, in my experience and for any of any of my drummer friends that are watching this that I've played with, it's it is usually the drummers, but they have, you know, obviously they're playing an acoustic instrument that yeah. you know they have to hit it to a certain degree to a, with a certain velocity. But yeah, it's usually the drummers that are just like, dude, could, could, you, could you maybe like tape up your snare or something? Or <laughs> you know, they're looking at you like, dude, I'm, you're standing right over my hi hat and snare. We're on a ten by ten stage. I I can only hit it so softly, you know. Yeah, right. You know, so. Um, but yeah. the ultimate There's big bummer when when the drummer like you hand him a pair of brushes and you're like, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> It's gotta happen. <laughs> you know, one of one of my one of my dear friends, a, a, a drummer that I love playing with, um, Sean Fitzgerald. We we gigged together. We played the same Saturday night gig for for ten years, and you know he would do just the opposite. Because that was the gig where you'd be standing over the hi hat and the snare. You know, it was just a club date, yeah. and and he would come every gig with a fresh set of earplugs for me. <laughs> you know, he really like he was the first guy in the band that was using in ears. So even within it, he didn't realize how hard he was hitting. You know, but he would be like, "I've got some fresh plugs for you tonight." You know, so so at least I'm not going to make you go deaf. Yeah. Right. You know, anyways. Um, so what do you think, like, what do you think the future of, of live bass is? Do you, I mean, obviously more and more, more and more stages are going to in-ears and clean stages and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, do you, do you, do you eventually see it, it, you know, well, we've already seen it. Like you said, you know, most, most of your stuff going in front of house is going through the helix anyways, but do you eventually see man i i don't want to say this word because we work for we work for the best base amp company in the world but do you eventually see base amps kind of going away for 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 the type of gigs that you're like big concert tour stuff um i think it depends on the the tour and the kind of music i think uh in the pop world almost definitely i think it already has i mean when I started on the Shakira tour, I had amps and all done in road cases and shipped them out. And they're like, oh, yeah, we didn't, t nobody told you it's a cl clean stage, no amps on stage. Yeah. Send all that stuff home. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think in that world, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and sort of why not? I mean, on a really big stage, it probably actually a lot of times sounds better out front if you don't have a bunch of noise coming off the stage and interacting in other mics and all that stuff. Having said that, if you're playing a, I don't know, thousand seat club, mm -hmm. you know, like a big club, then, and you're a rock band, like totally amps, of course, you know, it, you, you want that sound off the stage, you, you know? Um, so I think there's a, a, you know, what is it? Uh, apples and oranges kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, courses for horses for courses <laughs> in England, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think I I think I I would think that what's happening now the the sort of balance of it at this point would probably remain the people that use mm -hmm. amps and the situations that use amps will still continue to do that. Okay, okay. That's yeah. my feeling. I don't yeah. know. I know. No, no, no. That and again, you that's you you just you kind of pointed it out there, like you said, you know, for for what's happening now on big stages. But I think there's always going to be a need for you know for guys that are playing their local VFWs all the way up to you know playing thousand seat you know venues and things like that. There's always going to be a need for an amplifier on stage. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And um, also, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones. God forbid they all, you know, all, you know, you want some of that for a rock band like that. You want some yeah. interaction. And, you know, if the who goes back to not having an orchestra, we're going to have amps cranked. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. 
I'm curious too if like post COVID when everybody, I mean, production companies obviously won't really have a different frame of mind about this, but like if rock bands are just kind of like, there's just more of that energy of like, we want to get back out there and it's like probably going to be hyped up a little bit. And, you know, I wonder if that will play into having more amps. And if not, we'll just, uh, we'll start creating holograms, like eight, eight, ten, eight by 10 hologram lamps. We'll just create a little lamp and then inflatable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've done that. We've done the inflatable lamps. It didn't, <laughs> you know, we've done the we've done the thirty foot SVT. Yeah. Well, have, you done a, have you done an SVT pool floaty? <laughs> Come pretty, on. The fridge. Just on the fridge. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. And then the the, the pillow, pillow with the head. head. Yeah. Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. You and me, man. All right. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we'll have the to. John Button signature floaty. Come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you can tell I'm a real summer pool kind of guy. <laughs> you get your studio tan going. Oh, yeah, always. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true, though. You know, it's like I've, I've been having rehearsals here in the studio, and, you know, my, my guitar player is playing through a Helix, and our drummer is playing through an electronic drum kit. And then I get the SVT in the back of the and it's like, we're not that loud, but it's just, yeah. I got it in the studio, might as well use it, you know? Why not? Yeah. Um, man, this is so, you know, I, this is, I got to say it again, this is so awesome having you on. And, and like I tell everybody, it's like, you know, we, the, the few times that we get to talk throughout the year, it's usually one or two times at NAM. Which is not really talking. It's not yeah. really talking. It's a quick, you know, five minute catch up. Just give me the Reader's Digest version <laughs> on what's going on, and and you know, yeah. and also what? Uh, yeah. What? <laughs> and then like Dino, Dino, D Dino. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. So this is this is awesome having you on. Um, bases. Seeing. Uh, so you had your Rick. Yeah, where are you? But you're a P base guy too, primarily, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, early on, I was a jazz bass guy. I started on jazz bass, but, uh, so this is, should we do show and tell? Is that what yeah. we're doing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This is yeah. like, this is like, so this is my absolute desert Island baby. Uh, this is a 65. Okay. Um, got the rounds on it. Okay. Oh, nice. You know, you go get a sandwich and come back. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I got this years ago um, oh, really, really in LA when you could go to a bunch of guitar shops and they had vintage guitars on the wall and I played a whole bunch and I just, this spoke to me. Um, yeah. There's, can you see the, can you see the checking? Yeah. I can see the checking. Really. It checked quite nicely actually. It's pretty sweet. Um, this, this bass is just, uh, yeah. So I, mean, I, I use this for like 90% of the time this is in my hand um i use like this where part. it's relic is like almost it's almost like so perfect in all the areas that it's relic that it looks like a road worn no, like from a from a yeah. webcam obviously but like that, it's totally. freaking awesome yeah, yeah and the neck is just like oh. all the finish kind of went away it's just like that super butter yeah yeah um so i use this with the who on i i just play this the whole night i never switch just this i have a backup just in case which i've never used yep and it's this i played with a jap really huge japanese singer uh soyoshi nagabuchi i played with him for a few years he's like crazy huge in japan um like elvis like just wow. crazy anyway wow. i used i brought this to japan use it the whole show there was like a song that was really low and i ended up like tuning the you know doing some kooky tuning yeah, and you know, instead of using a five string, it's use this. Anyway, that's nice. that thing. Wow. Um, and then um, this is a fifty-eight. Wow. Um, the pick guard is awesome. Right. Yeah. Um, and I got the mute and flat miles. So this is that you know, like yeah. Motown, old seventies vibe. It's, it's got a weird. It's got like a darker than normal like tobacco sunburst doesn't it well yeah dark, I, mean, I think this is what they did in the 50s okay this is, i think well no that's not true is it i think there's a three-tone there right 
because that looks like yeah, like a two tone charcoal. It is a it's a two tone. Yeah, it's kind of ambery. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Right here. Tobacco. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. Pretty it could cool. be a card that's that's kind of offsetting, making it look darker than it normally is. Well, no, it is. I mean, uh, it's definitely oh, uh, yeah. less of the orange and the yellow. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, this is cool though. This it likes being in the flat wound dark kind of vibe. It's got mm. like super crazy checking on the fingerboard. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. It's fun though. Yeah. So it's got that total like retro. You plug this in and it's just like nice. Nice. Retro. Um, what else do I have that's interesting? Um this thing, Harmony H22. The wow. I I got this thankfully just before people sort of started rediscovering these. I got yeah. it on eBay for like five hundred bucks. Wow! Right unseen, and it turned out to be decent. Yep. Yep. Um, and it's wow. got a weird gold foil harmony. Yeah. Very um, cool. It sounds amazing. It's it's pretty big, but not just like yeah. Got point to it. It's super cool. Um, I think last time we did we check yeah. this one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the extra I'm super yeah. cool. Love that. Yeah, this thing's awesome. It's like vinyl <laughs> on the back. Wow. Um, and these goofballs, uh, whoop, goofball switches, cool. which is just funky. Is so cool. is, I love that headstock. Right. That's really yeah. cool. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, it's just fun. Is that short scale um, or? Yeah, short. Yeah. yeah. Do you um? Do you put your bases to any kind of like, or do you bring them to anybody to make sure that, you know, obviously you, you want them super quiet if you're going to use them in the studio, any kind of special treatments or anything like that? Yes. Well, mostly no, but this, I actually had, can I remember his name? It might come to me. Um, I had a guy put uh, a dummy coil inside here. So it's another like faux pickup. Okay. Some cancels because this thing, <laughs> sale yeah. live gold foil pickup can get pretty noisy. Yeah. Um, so we put like a dummy pickup in there. Um, and so that's one thing. Uh, other than that, yeah, they're pretty just stock. You know, some of them I have various people in LA. There are all kinds of great yeah. luthiers in LA. So I, you know, sometimes I haven't set up some stuff I do myself. Okay. And, you know, yeah, yeah. Because you never know. I mean, you know, how many times you know you bring a bass to a session, you know, and and you you play with it at home or you play with it in your home studio, and you think, man, this is this sounds great. You know, it's it's quiet, and then you bring it into the session. The engineer is like, oh my god, it's, I'm getting a getting a buzz in here, and you know, Ugh, next, next thing, oh yeah, your whole experience gets deflated. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, is like intonation surprise when you go up and you're like playing that line up here and you're like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, I I'll tell great. you, if I haven't done a session in a minute, which happens if I've been on tour for a couple of months, I come home, I will pull out all my bases and plug them in and check the intonation and make sure everything's working and fire up the amp. And yeah, I check, you know, before you're sitting there at, you know, East West studios at who knows, you know, and yeah. sit people staring at you. Yeah. And I, I tell you, every time I go to the studio and I set up my DI, my pedal board, and my I usually bring a B15, set all that stuff, turn it on. When I turn it on and it doesn't go, eh, I'm like, ah. <laughs> I mean, usually it doesn't. But if it does, you're just like, oh, yeah. God, yeah, like got to start <laughs> troubleshooting like gremlins, you know. And, yeah. do, you, do you generally bring a B15 to a session as well? Very frequently. Yeah, I have an old 60 or 65. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I frequently bring that. There are a fair number of studios that have a B15. Yeah. Um, and I sort of know which ones do generally. Or I'll shoot an email, you know, to the engineer and be like, hey, you know, should I bring my B15? And usually it's, yeah, yeah. if they have one, I'll just use it. Often it's already mic'd up. And you just, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, but pretty frequently, probably more than half of the time. Okay, fifteen. Plug it in. And how many bases do you normally bring John to a session? Uh, I know I know it varies from session to session. I'm sure. sure. Um, usually too many. 
Um, cause I have the feeling like, you know, if you're on a session and like whatever base would be the perfect thing and it's at home, what's the point yeah. of that? And how hard is it to throw it in the car? Right. You know, um, there are times where I'll bring a few bases that I'll leave in the car. I'm just like, probably won't use them. But if, if I'm like, Oh yeah, we, you know, um, yeah. but it's tricky sometimes cause frequently I don't have any idea, believe it or not, what. I'm doing, I get called by an engineer or producer, like, hey, can you do this session on Tuesday? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I, but sometimes I'll ask a question like, hey, you know, what's the vibe? Do I need to bring, should I be bringing fretless and five strings or should I be bringing punch up? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I would say on average, probably six. Okay. Six or, in the neighborhood, six or seven bases, something yeah. like that. Um, I often check this out. This is kind of fun. Um, where is it? Uh, Small tour of my studio. So I have this case. Oh yeah, yeah. Have you seen these? Yeah. The, this uh, goes on there, and then when you get it roll, it tips over and rolls. So you get to the studio, you pull this off, you're ready to go. That is That's cool. awesome. It's pretty cool. Really? Um, so I'll bring that, and then you know that has three in it, and then I'll bring another three or four. So you're your own cartridge, basically. <laughs> these days, yeah. You know, when I started doing sessions, it was just sort of on the tail end of people springing for cartage. Um, and these days, drummers usually will get sure. cartage. Um, sure. Most of the bass, I don't think many bass players are getting cartage these days. Yeah, yeah. screw up in your own stuff, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, because I'm, you know, back in the heyday, you know, you talk to guys like Sklar and and, sure. and, 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 and Steubenhaus and it'd be like, they'd have advanced rigs yeah. Two or three rigs. We go for Already one. set up at the next session. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, not anymore. Okay. All right. I don't think anybody's doing that. Even those guys. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Lee Sklar's dragging his own gear to session. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty yeah. sure. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean. We're on a session with him, but. <laughs> <laughs> no two bass player sessions at yeah. this Time? No two bases are in the same I've, place any at the same time ever. Right, right. I've done at least one. I did. Is it only one? I did do one. Uh, what was I? So I just came to visit on a session. Sean Hurley was playing bass on the session. Okay. Um, and they're like, grab a bass and do some lead bass. Or it was really fun. It was actually so cool to hear. I mean, I'm such a fan of Sean. He's Sean Hurley's such a brilliant player, and to hear him in the phones. You know, live while he's tracking, like God, yeah. just seems like a record coming out of the headphones. He's so That's good. So cool. yeah. He has a real light touch and just so smooth and buttery. It's just like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just saw he was doing something. He, I mean, he's always he's always, he's always doing something. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the game, name of the game. No, I just saw him on TV doing oh man. I forget. and I and I and I was gonna reach out to him saying you know, so, but I can't remember what it was now. It's like it'll it'll come to me. I'm Could sure. be anybody. Yeah, yeah, but it was like, it was a TV thing that I was watching. You don't, you know, like only like you or I or Dom or bass players that know Sean would go, "That's Sean," or yeah. hey, "That's Sean." You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, anyways, I've always been that guy though. As a kid, I was like, "Oh, there's exactly oh, yeah. it's it's that guy I know." Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like, I, yeah, years ago we were watching something on the Grammys, and I looked. My, my wife is sitting next to me. I go, Steubenhaus, he sounds awesome. He's playing that Tyler bass. <laughs> Don't look at me like you spend way too much time, <laughs> you know, geeking out over gear and players, and it's like, but that's why, you know, that's that that's my that's what I wanted to do for the longest time. I yeah. remember being in the grocery store with my brother and being like, oh, listen, it was like a Coke commercial. I was like, oh, my God, the reason he's like, dude, you got to, you're, it's, it's like, you got right? to, you got to chill out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, grocery store, it's a commercial. Like, <laughs> now, do you, do you, I mean, obviously, do you do this when you hear yourself? Like, if you're in the grocery store and you hear, hear a commercial or something? I've never heard know? myself at the grocery store. Oh, come I on, John. No, I, 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 there was one time, what happened? I had put on like a Apple, one of those, like, you know, Apple has those just like some random playlist. They like, yeah, sure. Play stuff for you. I put that on the living room. Da, 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 da. And I was like, why does this song sound so familiar? And it, 
it was something I had played on, and I was like, "See, <laughs> yeah. it's funny. That's I sound awesome. a lot better to myself when I don't know it's me." Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't know. Oh, it's me. Oh, it's, um, I'm you so like the of radio. Out. Like your mind's just like radio. Someone else produced. It, so it's like it's got to be good, perfect coming out. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's I think we're all like that. I mean, we're all so, yeah. you know. Yeah. We but hear. That's, that's yeah. the closest experience I've had to like. I mean, I, you know, I'm not on that many big recordings that would. I've been on like a, one or two singles that were on the radio. Like not not a whole lot. Now, would you say do you do you do more that or or soundtracks like movie soundtracks and things like that? What, what would you say the balance is? Um, more more playing on records. It's just the records I've played on just aren't big. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get you. It's, it's such it's such a humble way of saying it. That's I'm just gonna leave it like that, man. That's, that is awesome. You know, it's funny, though, um, funny enough, my next door neighbor is like the top call film and TV bass player. No way. Mike Valerio. Wow. Total monster. He He's one of these guys that can sit in the orchestra section and just kill it. And then they need like Ray Brown jazz thing. No yeah. problem. They need Marcus Miller. Just, whoa, he's like unreal. And so he plays on like John Williams requests him. You know, really? yeah, like I need Mike Valerio, you know, he played on the one of the new Star Wars where they did the cantina scene again. Mike mm -hmm. got to play bass on that. So oh, cool. and like, it's and, like a cool and then, and then, moment. Like, you know, on it, like, what was it a year or two ago? I was about ready to go on tour and like my bow just exploded. And I, I was playing just like one or two uh, bowed things with with Roger Daltrey. Um, I'm like. Mike, my blow bow just explained. He's like, Oh, I've got six here, you know. Or yeah. uh, the other day, I, I don't have a Music Man five string. I needed one for that cartoon we were talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's you know? what yeah, yeah. Like, we want it to be kind of chic, like chic. And I was like, oh, Okay, Mike, you got to Yeah, I've got a you know, 86 Music Man pristine great <laughs> group. Instead you know? of like, Hey, uh, you got butter or eggs? Uh, we're in a bind here. It's like, hey, you got to find yeah, right. <laughs> it. Hilarious. I'll get it like, you know, he's borrowed, he borrowed some of my stuff. I'll literally like grab a base and just walk out. The, no case. Just walk next door. Here you go. All right. Here. That's awesome. <laughs> I'll buy, I borrowed my phones from him and, you know, he's borrowed my B-15 and blah. It's just off. It's so L.A. Yeah. And then on the other side of me is a drummer producer and I play on stuff. That he produces all the time. That's killer. Like it's so you know. I can so get better neighbors. What the heck? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I I had to borrow a half inch open socket from my next door neighbor because that's that's about the extent <laughs> of it. You know? Hey, can I borrow your torque wrench? Mine, you know. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> um, I just I I just had a question too, and it went right Sorry, over. I went off on my no, neighbor. No, 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 no. no that's, but that, yeah, I mean, you're right though. That is so, you know, that is so LA. You know, you never know. You know, I, have you guys seen um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Oh yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I don't think I saw that. So I won't give away the movie, but one scene in the movie, Leonardo DiCaprio's character lives next door to Roman Polanski. Okay. You know what I mean? He's like, and he's sitting in his driveway and Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate pull up alongside of him to go up to their house. He's like, and he, and Leonardo looks at Brad Pitt, who's his bodyguard or his, uh, his stunt man, stunt double. And he's like, Roman Polanski, he freaking lives next door. Dude, I'm like one barbecue away from me, you know, landing a major partner in a Polanski movie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> <Roman is baby. laughs> But that's yeah. yeah. You never know who's who's going to be right next door to you. Yeah. yeah. I'm like here in New Hampshire. I can pretty much tell you who lives next door to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. That cartoon that I had to borrow the Music Man for that we keep talking keeps coming back. Uh, I got that because my son plays with the composer's kid. That's amazing. You know that's that is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> now, was your son playing bass too? No. Okay. Not much interest. He's an artist. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm like, cool. Stick. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I know it. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's in the in the early. Now, 
you know, in the early days when my kids were younger, it was, I tried giving them guitar and bass lessons. Yourself, you doing it. Yeah. And and you know what? It was like, nope, if you want guitar lessons, I'm going to hire a guitar teacher and we'll bring you just like I did, you know, because you're not going to listen to me. It's the only way to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And they, and that, you know, and that's how it worked out. And they did, you know, they, yeah. they're doing their other, their own thing now. But yeah, back in those days, it was like people would ask, "Are you teaching your kids music?" It's like hell no. Yeah. <laughs> they won't listen to me. Are you kidding? I know. I tell my son over and over, "Do you know who I am?" <laughs> <laughs> you should be telling your son, "Do you know who I am?" <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> so, are are you doing any recording at home? Are you doing? Yeah, quite a- Quite a bit. Um, I'm on a website called Sound Better, mm-hmm. um, where it's sort of like a clearinghouse for, I guess you'd call us music professionals. Okay. Um, you know, if somebody's making a record anywhere, they can go on there and like look at bass players and hire me. And um, yeah. so I, I do a bit of that. They send me a mix and I play on it and send it back. Um, the thing I did for the cartoon that we'll never stop talking about. I did that at home. Um, uh, my next door neighbors, funny enough, because it's COVID times, he's got a studio next door, but he emails me the track next door and I play on it here and email it back. You know? <laughs> um, and I've, I've done a, yeah, a fair bit of things here and there. Yeah. Just recording from home. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, I mean, I, I hate to use this. It's been so overused, but the new norm, you know, and it was kind of like, I, I mean, obviously people were doing that prior to COVID too. Mm-hmm. A lot of people were doing home sessions and, you know, yeah. fair share of that. But uh, because of COVID, obviously, you know, more and more people are embracing that. Yeah. I mean, I, I got to say, I'm kind of, it, it's fun. I like doing it, but I, man, I miss being in a room. And I, yeah. for a number of reasons, I mean, A, I have to engineer myself and I'm a pretty mediocre engineer. I miss yeah, and you go into you know Sunset Sound with a great engineer, and it's like, oh, it just sounds like oh, so yeah. good, you know. And I'm here, I get a pretty good sound, but you know, yeah, bro, you know, setting it up, yeah. Um, and they, you know, they have all that, cra- you know. I I have some gear, but you know, not like a top of the line studio. Um, and then of course, I I'm so, I just I spend way too much time like you know, micro splitting hairs. I punch, you know, I'll just do like 30 punching in. Like, whereas at a studio, you know, the producer would be like, yeah, John, it's fine. Like, you fine. Know, we're on. it's great. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'll spend, you know, I'll do like a two minute ballad. I'll spend three hours just like. Yeah. Agonizing over it, you know, plus you can't read people's body language too. If you're playing something that they're digging, you can see that they're digging it. Great or, point. You know, it's like, I mean, yeah. I've done, I've done sessions here at the house too, and I'll I'll send people like ten tracks, and say, pick one, and they'll say, yeah. well, number four was good. Okay, what you know? Did, did you like number five? Did you like number three? What did you like about number four? Yeah. Did you, there's no body. There's, there's no interaction. Like, hey, can you give me what you did on the chorus on that, but the verse on this song? Could you? Could you? Yeah, you, that reminds me of a, a couple things regarding that. One is that I. I learned early on, I would do a whole track thinking this is the way it should be. And I'd like do my 35 takes spending three hours. And I sent it to them. They're like, nah, I didn't, no, that's not what we were going for. So I learned to, and not everybody is open to this, but I try to just do a rough one take. I hate sending that out of my house. Yeah. yeah. If yeah. it's not perfect, but, and I do like, I'll do the verse and the first chorus. Yep. Print them an MP3. It's not perfect. Let me know if I'm in the right direction. Is this the right bass? Is it the right tone? Am I on the right track? Yeah. Am yeah. I even playing the right chords that you want? <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes you'll, they'll just send you a guitar and it's like, right. is that C major or A minor? I don't right. know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's one. And then number two, um, lately I've been more leaning towards using plug-in amps. I love setting up my B15 and miking it. But like last week, I did a session for somebody a month ago. They write me back and say, hey, I changed a couple of chords in the guitar. Like, can you 
Can like you- I re whatever. I'm like, no problem. I had used a plug-in amp and I also take photos of all my outboard gear, the settings. Uh, okay. I store those in my session. So when I open the session up, I can see what all my compressor and mic pre and everything set at. Yeah. Pull up the saved settings on the plug-in amp, punch in three notes from a month ago and send it back and go, there you go. It's fixed. Wow. So you co- oh. you, you covered your ass on that one. Yes. <laughs> and if I had mic'd up an amp, I would have had to re-record the whole thing because I probably couldn't. I yeah. It'd be tough to try and match the sound to be able yeah. to punch in. Yeah. Well, plus mic placement and all that other. Well, you know, so all many variables. Yeah. So when everything's in the computer, like, boop, it's right. kind of handy. So I've been doing that a lot lately, even though, like I say, I miss, I mean, and there are still times people request a real amp or if, if, if I tell them whether I'm using it or not. Yeah, um, yeah. And, or I also like, you know, I like micing an amp up and doing that. Yeah, yeah of course. I was recently using uh, my B15 for guitar stuff. I, it was actually, this guitar was going through Helix into the B15 and it sounded cool. absolutely incredible. <laughs> and I was like, awesome. this, this is more work for me, but it, I can't pass this up. This sounds cool. so good. I have to like it. So for guitar, you were going through the Helix into the B15 and yeah. then that? Yeah, and it just started that way because we were just running stuff through in the room, and I was just using channel one, and he was using channel two. But then it sounded so good that I was just like, "We got, we have to mic this." That's cool. It I'll really to, worked out. Yeah, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to try that. And I have to say, speaking of that, I've been using my Apex Stomp. I pretty much use that as a distortion box mm-hmm. these days. Yep. And so I'll pull up a distortion on that, plug it into an amp. And mic it, awesome. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, see, I'm I'm learning all this stuff too. I'm still I'm stealing both your ideas. Guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try the Marshall <laughs> idea. I haven't I haven't used that yet. Just like a <laughs> guitar distortion amp for like a flavor of the channel to blend in. Yeah. I'll so try. we got the 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 Helix as a as a distortion box. We got the pool floaty. I'm keeping track. Yeah. Of, <laughs> yeah. Using, the whole right. This is this is this is the John Button royalty list. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> I, I want a piece of every freaking floaty you guys sell. <laughs> uh, well, but we did. You know, it's funny. We did at one point. Ampeg had one of those big inflatable yard things, um, and it was an SVT. And this I think was I've like seen that somewhere. Yeah, this was like back in in like the old St. Louis music days, and I think one of the sales reps still has it. One of the old sales reps, but yeah, it was this big thing, and um, you had to tie it down because if there was any kind of like wind storm or even just like a gust, it would it would upheave the whole thing. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll maybe if we can size that down a little bit and seriously make a pool floaty out of it. Would anybody that's watching this? Let, is this something that you would buy? Uh, <laughs> SPT pool floaty. <laughs> go to Ampeg Idea Scale and uh, there you go. Up, up, up. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. You're welcome. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh man. Well, let, I know we went totally over on this, but oh, uh, did we? Yeah, it's, it's been only ten minutes, right? It's so fun. I mean, that that's the whole we thing. Were, uh, I think we were supposed to talk about that cartoon that you tracked for. <laughs> yeah, we need to bring that up again. <laughs> I, this must have been when I was offline then, because I, I don't remember this conversation about. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm looking through some of the comments here, and everybody's everybody's like, you know, digging my first SVT, love the vid. Oh, some, uh, uh, I I know I'm going to butcher your first name here, but Nais, Nais, N A E S, love the video he did with the SBL Academy. Oh right, Scott's bass lessons. There you go. If people don't, oh, yeah. people yeah. out there don't know yeah. that is a re, sign up. You can do a free, yep. Like sign up on there. I don't get anything from them. I'm not, you know, I'm just. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm a member because I go on there and check out lessons. I mean, it's there's so much great material on there. Anyway, when I was in London, they did a little interview with me and had me attempt to play some. Actually, they have a funny thing where they they it's called the SBL challenge or something. They take a piece of music and just boop, here you go. One, two, three, four, go. And, um, and just sort of talk about your thought process with that. And so they did that to me and it turned out actually pretty good. Okay. 
man. That's like my myself. myself. Scott's such a nice guy too, man. I I can't say enough things about him. You know, well, you know, I've been watching his videos, and yeah, he seemed like such a just great guy. And I actually reached out to him, like, "Hey, let's just I want to hang out with you and get a coffee when I'm in London because right. you seem really cool." And then he's like, "Well, let's you know get a camera and interview." And I was like, "All right." Yeah, yeah, very yeah. cool. Yeah, he's awesome. He's yeah. incredibly talented. He's oh, such a good bass player too. Woo. Yeah. But what a thing that he's created! How amazing yeah. is that? Like such a just incredible thing. Yeah. Right, I know it. I, he's, yeah, he has turned it into quite a, quite a, a an empire. empire. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, well, uh, I'm just. Uh, yeah, we should do. We didn't really do many questions from people. In well, the I'm going through the list here, and you know, obviously, we've got Paul Trainer from Liverpool, UK, saying hi. Hello. Um. Uh, Oran, I bought my first SVT in 1976, used it five years, sold it to Cal Arnold, formerly with Edgar Winter. Interesting. That's cool. Um, uh, Roger, a uh, friend of mine, Roger Smith, what do you all think about the SBT rig that debuted in 1969? Uh, I, was, one, right? I was about two years old then, so I don't quite remember that, but no, SBT. SBT. Um, I do vaguely remember what the SBT was. Um, I never I, heard of that. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to go through the history book and all, but I believe it was a solid state SVT version. I can look it up in, in Is the, that super base technology. It Is did. You maybe? never know. You never know. Roger, if you're still watching this, we are reading your question. So, <laughs> um, super button technology. Yeah, let us know. Um, <laughs> I need that. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, no. Nah, we the last thing we need is more buttons on our stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, man, I'm like, I'm. We covered our, all the stuff that I wanted to cover as well. You know, um, Dina, you can breathe now. You can you can relax. You can <laughs> take a shower. I, can sweaty, bro. I already took a shower. <laughs> I, 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 I I had like a couple of pots of coffee this morning before I went to the gym, so I'm a little I'm still a little amped up. Uh, oh, uh, question here: Any chance on Ampeg bringing the B15 back? Well, that's a question for Dom. Being the always president. a chance, always. there's always a chance. That's the most political answer, but it's the safest answer I can give. Exactly, <laughs> there's always a chance. You well, never wait, know. Speaking of which, should we take a peek at my B B15? Yes. yes. While we're doing. So it's it's in this other room here. So actually, for my little studio, I have like a little walk-in closet that I can mic an amp up in. It's got nice. tie lines into my studio. Let's see, can we see it? Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, look, open the door more. Yeah. So I have it in a head box. There it oh, is. There it is. I can't get much closer because I'm on a tethered yeah. to an Ethernet line. Yep, we can um, see it. Yeah. And I think that's a 65. Okay. Um, and I had it. Uh, I got that head box from. I think what are they called? Fliptops.com or something? Yeah, Bruce's place. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was having trouble sometimes in the studio with, you know, when you bolt a pile of tubes and stuff to a 15 inch speaker. Yep. <laughs> sometimes things start rattling. So I had the separate head thing yeah. done so it would wouldn't rattle. Um, and, that, and that's the rig that you bring on sessions. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, the, little, the little wheels. Screw yeah. on the bottom, and yeah. then yeah, you pull those off so they don't rattle. Yep. And yep. Off yep. I go. And that's so it's it's permanently mounted in that head box. You don't do the flip top or anything like that anymore. No. Yeah. You know, it, you know, I, I uh, 64, 65, yeah, I would still be rattling too. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was born to <laughs> rattle some, so <laughs> The, the other upside is that then the cabinet is lighter to lift. You can lift the two things That's like true. with the head in the cab, lifting that into the car is like, oh. That's true. Oh, so yeah, it's Sean Reyes backwards. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> you totally got us on that one. Nez Sayer. Sean <laughs> Reyes. Man. Same monoxyl is backwards. <laughs> so Lexanom. Oh, look at that. Jeez. Tell me Jeez. I've never asked that before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. 
Uh, well, listen, um, we're, we're starting to, we're bordering on being silly now. So, um, John, uh, we want to have you back on at some point. Anytime. You know, uh, Anytime. it's my pleasure. Yeah, dude. Th thank yeah, you. Thank for you on. It's, it's such a pleasure to have you on and it's fun. Know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, hopefully I say this all the time, you know, we're, we're, we're turning the corner and, and we're, I know we're going to see live music back sometime soon. I, I'm, I'm praying in the next year, in the next six months. Um, I'm getting little. Okay. Murmurings of August, September. Okay. Not the who, but some what other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Cool. No, nope, don't. That's all right. That's all right. No, that's something. People are people are asking availability. Yeah, you know, it's. I mean, I think we're all kind of chomping at the bit now. It's like, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm everybody. I'm, fans are just like, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. everybody wants to go out and hear music. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I, hopefully, I I think it's going to be. You know, they they said, you know, with the the what was it the plague, you know, it was um, nineteen eighteen. I think it was oh, correct. And that led to the Roaring Twenties. I think that's. I think we're going to see a renaissance. Likely to happen again. There's yep. so much, so much pent up everything. Yep. Yep. You know, the, yep. Yeah. And everybody's going to be hugging at Nam. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah. We, yeah, we maybe not. <laughs> we still be doing elbow bumps, but <laughs> hug hugs are better than handshakes. For um, as far as I know. Yeah. yeah. So, no. It's bring true. it. So, well, we look forward to seeing you out on the road. Yes, sir. Seeing you soon. You guys are in California, so at any time, you know, if you want to stop by, I don't know what the what the policy is with with artists coming out to Calabasas. I think pretty I think soon. Calabasas is still still pretty locked up tight. Yeah. Get get a couple more shot needles in people's arms and yeah. uh, see how it goes. I know I know Dom is uh, you know, Dom's cooking up some really cool stuff with the engineering team and the development team out there and like you did with yeah. the SMT50. By the way, um, there was a holdup on swag because I know we owe you a hoodie from the last as what, what the heck? I'm you know, I check my mailbox every you know, outside the door. Where it <laughs> is it there yet? So there, there was a little bit of a holdup on that, but it is coming, I promise. Love it. Uh, yeah, at any time, like I said, when things open up, if you can get out to Calabasas and sit down with Dom and check out some of the new cool stuff that they're working on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anybody that's caught chiming in here that, you know, when are we going to see some new stuff? It's it's there. It's coming. You know, it's yeah. just as a COVID and us not being able to get into the office to work on stuff. It's, you know, it holds everything up. So I promise you guys it's coming. So Very soon. Very soon. Yeah. John, thanks again, man. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Pleasure's mine. Yeah, guy. Thank you. Thank you. Take care of your family. Be safe. Be healthy. We'll do. And, uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks, and, uh, I think uh, Aaron, our producer behind the scenes, has been yeah. an old thing. Uh, and then I think April 1st, uh, in two weeks, we have Chris Weiss from Hollywood Vampires. And yeah. and the cult, and he's coming on. He's going to be a guest on the show as well. Monster. Yeah, check it out. All well, right, guys. Stay well, Thanks. guys.